is Sunday, May the 16th, and Sarah and I are here at Ipsit Creek Campground in Mount Rainier National Park, and we are going to try and make it up to the Carbon Glacier coming down off of the Nord Wand of Mount Rainier. Uh, it's been a pretty tough month for me. I've been immobile with a pretty bad back strain, and I really haven't been able to get out, and I'm really thankful that I was able to just make it to this spot right here. Uh, we've already covered the five miles from the trailhead up the Ipsa Creek Road to the campground here. Uh, I did some nice stretching when I got here and I'm feeling good enough to take on the challenges ahead. Uh, there's probably going to be a few curveballs up ahead. It's only a three mile hike up to the terminus of the Carbon Glacier, uh, but the lower crossing of the Carbon where the Wonderland goes over the river uh, can be kind of treacherous at times, especially in spring conditions when there's a lot of snow melt and the river is as high as it is right now. Uh, so we might not even make it past that spot in the hike. That might be the turnaround point. You never know. That's why I love this trail and I come back year after year after year and uh, I make the trek up to the glacier and back. It's a great trainer. It's a great uh, activity to do just in a day, and uh, it'll really get you prepared for the future. Let's get going. So a lot of the signage at the National Park Service puts up here at Mount Rainier is in pretty good detail, and it gives you a good overlook of what lies ahead with the Upper Carbon River Valley. Right now we're right here at Ipsit Creek. And uh, there's Ipset Falls right up there, and here's the Ipset Creek Road, which you have to hike on or bicycle on five miles to get to the camp. And then the trail is just a continuation of the, the Carbon River Rainforest. It climbs up gradually, and uh, right here is the lower crossing of the Carbon. And that can be, um, it's different every year. So you just got to come up here not knowing what to expect and be ready to um, either make a decision to turn around or continue there. The Wonderland Trail here is no longer existent. It's, it's gone. It's not used anymore. So you have to cross over to the other side of the valley and then head up to the terminus of the Carbon. And the glacier comes down here. It's a valley glacier with a very large cirque on the north face of the mountain. As you can see here, they are warning us already that the bridge is out. I'd like to go check it out though just to see. You might find another place to cross. So we'll go find out. The first little bit of the trail kind of goes up above the rainforest bottom and you get these sections where the Carbon River is braiding and eroding away parts of the forest floor and just leaving these bare stream beds with the volcanic cobbles in the bottom. It's really peaceful and charming in here and it's a great stretch of the trail because it really does turn into a trail after you leave Ipsit Creek Campground.
Here's a good shot of the Carbon River in spring conditions. It's flowing pretty high right now and it has lost its clear, its clear conditions that it had in the winter time. Uh, all the snow in the rocks has melted away and it has that classic chocolate milk glacial till look to it. Uh, it's probably very gritty right now and that is not water that I would want to filter from uh, if you want to make your filter last long. But uh, the cloudier it becomes, that signifies the rate of glacial melt up valley. So, if it, and I've seen it darker than this before. But we'll see what it looks like further up. The decimation of the Carbon River Valley. Its propensity for destruction is immense. Eventually you reach the first avalanche chute, is what I call it, where the trail kind of gives you this view up at these uh, cliff faces that are forested. And uh, in the winter time, this is covered with a lot of snow and they do avalanche down and there is a lot of rock slide in here. So it's just a place you just kind of gotta watch out for. And it also is where Kind of the first views down the valley open up and you can see a lot of the foothills around you. Even here in the Cascades you get nice groves of alder trees in the bottoms of these valleys. So this is the second avalanche chute that the trail takes you through. And uh, you can see here all of the rubble coming down from those precipices up above the trail. It's just not a place you really want to linger, especially in the early spring and winter time, because a lot of snow will slide off Mother Mountain there. That's just a section of Mother Mountain. It's a big complex of peaks. So the sign says, no bridge, no bridge, no alternate route. Well, I don't really want to give up quite yet. So we are going to try our luck at finding another crossing, maybe further down. But right here is definitely a no-go. The Carbon River is for sure raging at this moment. We are going down through the forest. We found some logs that are very big and cross the river completely. And we're hoping we can make it happen down here. So we are about to break out of the forest and we are in luck because we think we found a line that will work right there. There's our log. And I think that one is going to take us across. And then we simply have to go back up the river on the other side and find the carns that lead us to the east side of the valley. So Sarah's going to head down and give it the final check, see if it goes. Pretty gnarly section. But I have a feeling that it is gonna work.
So it's always a good idea before you do a crossing of a river on a log to unbuckle your straps. A uh, backcountry ranger told us today that he has had to recover two fatalities in the recent past from people falling off logs into the carbon, getting swept down the river, and getting trapped with their backpacks, unable to get them off. So unstrap your packs before you cross the rivers. So we came down the trees, and we crossed over right down there on a bigger log. And then we just scrambled up through these boulder fields right here. And now we are where the old crossing used to be. Uh, you can see the Wonderland Trail right up here, cut into the hillside. And we were just standing up there looking at the sign. And this is where the old crossing uh, should be. You can see right down here, this is the old footbridge. The river is raging right now. It would be unsafe to cross by foot, I think. It'd sweep you away. And when you look up valley here, you get your first great views of Tahoma. And you can start to see the Carbon Glacier right there. We're gonna go through the trees and work our way up the other side of the valley to see what happens. So we are back on the Wonderland Trail and we have found uh, this remnant, this section of old trail here that kind of looks like a bridge graveyard. You can see multiple foot logs over here that were bridges at one time uh, going through the middle of the valley. Uh, over here you can see how the bark is missing off of that that uh, that bridge and what we both think is happening there was that was at one time how high the water was that went over the bridge and uh, put it out of commission. There's a lot of plunge pools in this area a lot of old water, braided streams. You just never know which path the carbon is going to take from year to year when it, uh, when it floods and recedes and goes through its periodic cycles. So when this log fell, it fell perfectly on top of the footbridge. And it just added to the strength of the crossing. So we are roughly 0.4 of a mile downstream from the snout of the Carbon Glacier. Before you head up there, you come by this man-made structure. Uh, I just call it the Indiana Jones Bridge over the Carbon River. 
got across it just to have a little bit of fun. And uh, there's some features I'd like to show you on the other side of the bridge over there. Good look up the valley. We're actually going to go up there in just a few minutes, not too much further. exposure of rock that has been smoothed by glacial weathering and erosion. You see all the striations going down valley etched into the stone. That's from the rocks and the gravel embedded in the ancient carbon glacier that has receded further up the valley. Uh, the carbon glacier does have the namesake of having a terminus that is at the lowest elevation in any glacier in the lower 48 states. I believe it terminates around 3,800 feet above sea level, um, but it still lies roughly a little over a quarter mile up the valley from here. So let's go up and check out the terminus of the Carbon Glacier. Here's a good look at the Nordwand. Right here in the foreground is the Carbon Glacier. It comes down. You can't see the head of it, but over here is the Emmons Glacier. You can see just a piece of it. And then Curtis Ridge climbs up and goes up to the snow dome up on top. There's Willis Wall, which is the, uh, the head wall of the Carbon Glacier, and for those who climb it, for those who climb Willis Wall, I've heard it is the Minotaur, the Medusa, and the Hydra all wrapped into one. And then right here, center picture, we got Liberty Ridge going up. There's Liberty Cap, 
which is actually the third highest summit on Rainier, but it's one of the toughest climbs in the Cascades. We got Liberty Cap Glacier coming off with its giant glacial walls just hanging off of the north face. And then over here, we have the Mowich face and Tarmigan Ridge. And those are all very sought after climbs on Rainier's Nordwand. It has a lot of objective hazards, as you can see. The entire time that you're on a wall like that, you have uh, looming, overhanging glacial ice. And as you get closer to the mountain, you can actually witness and hear giant bergs calving off and crashing down the face of the mountain there. They say that the ice cliffs up there, you can see the ice cliffs going from Liberty Cap over and you can't see Columbia Crest from here, but those ice cliffs are anywhere from two to three to maybe 400 feet thick. Very daunting and very beautiful. Well, here we are at the overlook of the terminus of the Carbon Glacier. And I'm gonna reward myself with some M&Ms. And I need these calories to get back down. I can't remember a more hotter day than we've ever been here. Pretty hot out right now, I'd say upper 70s, maybe even pushing 80. There's a lot of snow melting. It's pretty sweaty getting up here. Uh, the rocks are reflecting a lot of heat. Uh, my back feels hurting at times. It feels pretty good right now. I'm actually pretty surprised I was able to make it up here. I just took it slower today. I usually don't use a walking stick when I hike, but I think I'm getting to that age. I'm gonna have to more and more. It really helps having a third leg. There was one point when we were crossing the boulder field down below, I put the walking stick out. It's made of bamboo, but I felt it almost flexed to the point where it almost broke. If that would have happened, it would have fallen on my face. That wouldn't have been very fun. This is about as far as you can go up. You hit snow and then it just gets snowier and snowier from this point up until later in the year, of course. There's some good camping further up this trail. I think it's called Dix Creek. And there's another one down there at Cataract Creek. I like Cataract Creek just a little bit more. The creek is really pretty down there. Um, great views of Mount Rainier. Great views of the Nordwand. Carbon Glacier it looks as black as ever, hence the name Carbon. It's because of all the all the glacial till that's stuck in it. It's not too bad. It's a pretty nice view. About 8.5 miles. I'd say 8 to 8.5 miles from the National Park boundary to this spot where we usually turn around and head back. Very gradual flat at first, gradually climbed the most steepest at the end here. Uh, it's going to make it a 16 mile day hike, round trip. It's a good one to burn fat, get the calories off. So uh, I'll give you a closer look at the Carbon Glacier and some features of glaciation in just a second here. So here's a good view of the terminus of the Carbon Glacier. And you can see where the Carbon River comes out of its snout, it comes down the valley right there. Okay. You can see how it is carved, nice U-shaped valley out of that bedrock right there. You can see over here on this side, those are called lateral moraines, and they come all the way up. Where are they? They're right there, and they come all the way up to here. And imagine ice filling up, up to those lateral moraines. And those are just, you know, the sides of the glacier, the sides of it. Those are the lateral moraines. And then down here, 
Down here you can start to see some terminal moraines of it where its snout used to be. I can remember me and Sarah came up here for the first time probably, I don't know, 10 or 11 years ago. And I would say that the Carbon Glacier at that time was down here. I think I have photographic evidence to support that. And that just shows how much in 10 years it has receded up the valley and thinned. It looks different every year we come up here. This about does it for this day hike. It's in the books and we're about ready to head back down the valley. It's pushing 2.30 in the afternoon. It's a little bit later than uh, we're used to. It's gonna take probably three to four hours to get back to the car. By that time, it'll be closer to seven. And then we still have to drive home to the farm. So we have a long ways to go ahead of us. Gorgeous day, amazing views. Really happy we came up here. Glad it had some problem solving in it. Glad it had some cross country travel. And I'm glad we beat the status quo today. Everybody was turning around at the lower crossing. And we just did a little bit of problem solving, pushed through, and we were rewarded with what you see right there behind us. It's awesome. Can't wait to come back. And uh, see you next time.